people out here for the first time. If you had some tips to give them before they came out, what would it be? Well, the probably the biggest and first and foremost tip is you got the rod or the equipment, go out there on your lawn and practice before you come to a destination fishing uh, river such as the Green here where it is complete destination fishery to not spend at least a few hours a week on a lawn just to get comfortable before you come all this distance. It's, you know, it's a lot of investment to come out here to fish and you want to be on your game. You want, whether you're a beginner or an expert, everyone gets rusty or everyone needs to learn. So spending a little time on the, on the uh, lawn or on a, in a pool if you have access to a pool, um, anything like that is just a huge benefit. Uh, a pond on a golf course, for instance, is a popular spot to practice your uh, cast before you come. You know, another tip when you come to the river, uh, you know, the first thing you want to do when you get a boat with a guide is, you know, tell them what you're looking for. Uh, if you're looking to learn today, which, you know, all, most guides, that's first and foremost what their concern is, is making your angling skills better. Not how many fish you catch, but how uh, far your cast progress and your knowledge of the river. Um, but always talk to your guide first thing in the parking lot before you even get to the ramp. Let them know what skills you So you just spin the hemostats, any hemostat will work. Uh, makes tying that really easily. And uh, for me, the benefit mainly was with my dry flies, they would come out looking the same way as when I put them on the, in the beginning. And then, you know, right there, we're a little past 12 inches, little dropper, give it a little action. Um, another great thing with these droppers, besides the tungsten head, is to put something behind those with a little foam in it. Gives it a little more swimmy action, a little dip type action if this style dropper isn't working for you. Downstream swing, I'm gonna cast over here and I'm going to swing it down and giving it a little pop like I'm letting the current move it around. Just like that. God, I felt a little bump there. They'll spall it all the way around. Okay, now when you fish these streamers, notice I'm bringing that rod up and I'm going to shoot the line. The minute it hits, notice downstream line, we're going to strip it. This is that cone head keyway, it's bumping the bottom. Oh, there's a bump, there's a bump. And I find it's very easy to fish a streamer out of a pocket boat. Or even kick boats, or whatever you want to call them. We used to, of course, call them float tubes. But now we've got all these sophisticated boats for that purpose. Now, I'm going to use a line that I, I find the best for fall fishing. In fact, I use it an awful lot. Uh, the one I'm going to use is called a ghost tip, and it's by Cortland, but he's making this line, no matter who you get it from. It's a floating line with anywhere uh, from 15 to 5 feet, depending on which one you buy. Uh, some are 12 feet, of intermediate line. Now, what is intermediate line? It's slow sinking line. It sinks very, very slow. And it's clear. And it's a clear uh, intermediate line. And then you'll, as we come up to here, it'll become floating line. And we'll have 15 feet. Now, there's several ways that we can set this up as I'm uh, putting the line through. One of my favorites, and I'm going to show you how to do it here, is to add a sinking leader. But before that, I'm going to show you how to make your own uh, streamer leaders. There's no point in going to a store and buying a streamer leader. So I'm going to take you away, by the time we get back, from me showing you the, how to build your own streamer leaders, I'll be ready to show you how to put a sinking leader on.
Well, you still want to keep a butt section, uh, regardless of what leaders you use. Now, we just showed you how to tie one, but you'll find yourself lots of times doing a loop-to-loop -loop connection. And what's happening now, a lot of the fly line companies are building in the loops already for you in the fly line. But one of the easiest ways to use this leader, it, it actually came out of Europe. This is tungsten. And uh, this happens to be a Climax, uh, Rio, uh, Orvis, almost everybody's making it now. And I want you to think about, if you're adding split shot to a streamer or a woolly bugger to get it down deeper, you're going to really test the warranty of your rod. That probably breaks more rods at split shot, nicking a rod, than having it break when you're dry fly fishing. So what I tell everybody, this is the equivalent of split shot. It's elongated, and it won't break your rod. You find other ways of breaking your rod, right? <laughs> OK. What we're going to do is do a loop-to-loop -loop connection. And uh, one of the uh, important things about the loop-to-loop -loop connection is you can tie your other leaders that way. And if you decide you don't want the sinking leader, you don't have to retie it all up. You can just do a loop. Uh, the loop-to-loop -loop connections came through the salt water, because in salt water, you had to change flies and, and leader systems really quickly because the fish would come upon you very quickly. And it's just a fast way of doing it. Now we got the loop-to-loop -to -loop together right here, as you can see. Nothing to catch the fly on. Now these are normally six foot in length. Now you're going to say, wait a minute. What am I going to do? Because there's another loop right down here. Well, loop-to-loop -loop again. We're going to need to put some tippet on. Now, don't think you need very much tip. 18 inches maximum. And we're going to go ahead and uh, judging this river as well as uh, in the many years that I've spent fishing it, uh, I would be a little lighter on the tippet than normal. And I'm going to use uh, about a, uh, a maximum about five to six pounds in their ultra green. And we're going to put another uh, loop in there. Again, go loop to loop. And we're, we're going to tie this in. We showed you in the knot ni uh, section uh, how to tie uh, that loop. Uh, also, make sure you bring your glasses along. I put my sunglasses on. It's getting late in the day. Well, I'm going to have to put it on anyway late in the day so I can see. Knots are really important. And it's not that you know how to tie a lot of knots. You need to know how to tie a few knots quickly and right. This is one knot. A loop knot is one. Perfection loop is the, the main name of it. it. Is a knot that you want to learn how to tie very quickly. In the old days of uh, bait fishing, we called them snell. Snell, knot, uh, snell hook, bait hooks, and they had them already built in for you. OK, so now we've got our We've got three levels here. We've got a heavy small butt section, which we've attached it. Now, we could, if we had a loop built into our line, which, like I say, some of the lines come that way now, we wouldn't have to add that. Now, by the way, these sinking leaders come in intermediate, uh, medium sinking, and heavy sinking. Uh, so I always like to say one split shot, two split shot, three split shot is how you do it. So now we're going to take. And we're going to do again our loop-to-loop -loop connection uh, right here. So we've got two loop-to-loop -loop connections on this. And uh, the most important part of this, now a lot of people ask me, why don't you use fluorocarbon? Yeah, actually, I do use a lot of fluorocarbon. Uh, and I'm going to give you tip number one working with fluorocarbon. First of all, we're in a boat. And in a boat, I'm in a canyon. If you can look around here, I'm going to tell you why I don't want particularly losing flies. Not on fish, but on rocks. Problem with fluorocarbon, it has a tendency of breaking in a knot when it hits something like those rocks back there. I tend to use them in the right spot. Still water fishing, they're absolute a necessity. But when you're fishing around places where you can clip something, you're going to break it at the knot. Now, one knot will help you, and I showed it to you tonight. Uh, in your knot section, Phil Rowley tied in our knot section one of those loop knots. And those loop knots are much better at handling 
uh, a collision with something. Uh, so I'm going to still, though, when I tie my streamer on or whatever we're going to put on today to run through some of these uh, drifts and show you a little bit about streamer fishing and some of my tips on streamer fishing, we're going to use a loop knot. So that's one of our tips. When you're using a streamer, you use a loop knot. Why? First, one, because it's better with fluorocarbon. Two, it gives you more fluid movement. Now, remember just a little while ago, we were trying to uh, get, uh, I was showing you how to check your drift on that fly. You know, when I get down to those small flies, really small flies like we were using, 28s, that's another question that a lot of people say, should I be using a loop knot? My question is, probably Some should. of you, that's 24 inches. Uh, to me, that's about 18 inches, depending on uh, where you're fishing in the world. So uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, selecting uh, streamer patterns. And, and I want to give you three things and criteria. And I don't care if you're fishing for bass or, or any fish that eats a minnow. I think these are really the important factors. In bass, color is a huge, huge thing. In trout, depending on the kind of day it is, it's probably less. What's more important is size. Size is probably the most. You're not, if fish are eating minnows that are this big, you're not going to talk them into eating minnows this big. Or if they're eating minnows this big, talk them into eating minnows that big. So what we got to do is try to have, find out what sizes people predominantly use on the area. And I'll tell you, that's knowing the minnows that are in the water. So size is a factor. And you can do that by if you find a fish following your fly and he's just kind of bumping it and checking it out and not taking it, that's usually a size problem. OK, now talk about color. As you notice right here, the sun's going down right now. We're in the later part of the day. Remember, a fish can see completely at night. He can see when you can't see. Why? Because his eyes don't open and close with the light. It's like a camera. It's wide open. It brings in the light. You want uh, to have something that's going to show up in a snowstorm. Think of that. When we start getting lack of light, you'd think it gets dark. But to fish, it gets light. When light is diffused like that. We'll, we could show you right now. In fact, here's some underwater footage that's taken at night. And what do you see in there? It's all, it, it, it's, it's white. You need contrast. So what kind of fly are we going to put on right now? A darker fly. I don't care if it's a woolly bugger. I don't care if it's a streamer. We're going to go dark. So let's go tie one on. Here's a Here's a great selection of uh, different types of, uh, I mean, you could uh, say that these are streamers, but they're really leeches. When I say streamers, that covers a multitude of sins from uh, woolly buggers to bunny leeches uh, to pure old sculpins, but it also covers a fly uh, that I use a, a fair amount in some streams, uh, and that is a crayfish. And I did really well a few weeks ago on the Wind River on a crayfish. And this would be a crayfish type pattern right here bright and, and uh, crazy. It could be a stonefly too, but it's nature the way you fish it. As much, the, the nature is the way you fish it that really makes it a streamer. Now, one of the things in the fall, and this is a, something we talk about the fall, is slowing things down. But streamer fishing is a lot of experimentation. You try something, see if it works. You slow your strip down, you dead drift. It is a never a set way that works all the time. But setting the fly on the fish and hooking the fish and being successful taking a strike uh, to a hookup is always the same. And, and I don't care if you're in a lake, it's done by feel, not by sight. And that's it's hard for a lot of people that are dry fly fishermen and nymph fishermen that are, are watching for an indicator to go down or something to be told to them. I hate to say it, streamer fishing getting back to the old worm fishing where you feel how, how, how a line feels. 
So let's uh, let's take a look. We're going to select one off here because the light's going. I'm going to definitely do a dark one. And I've got one right here that I think looks pretty darn good. And I see my friend Tom, who's down here fishing, he's got the same fly on. I think we're going to try it. It's kind of a, a leechy looking uh, thing. It's got a cone head on it. Oh, right now. And I'm getting in behind rocks. And I'm pulling the fly so they're getting a side view of it. Very important. By casting upstream, they're, lo they're looking upstream. I'm casting the fly upstream, and then I'm swinging it in front of their nose so they get a side view of it. Now, like right now, I want to get up by that rock, letting it swing down, let the sinking leader drop. Again, I'm feeling everything. I didn't feel anything that time. On that last fish, I felt a couple bumps, and I kept stripping. Now, right here, I want to go right to the bank and slowly pull it down, let it sink down. The more I slower I pull it, the more it's going to sink. Oh, not this time. A lot of rocks in here, Bruce. That's the perfect water for this. Yeah. One of the things that I find is not try to do a lot of false casting. This is uh, one of the times when you want to uh, learn how to do a haul, what we call. So I come forward, I pull it, that shoots the line out coming over some ripples. One of the things that you want to do is be stripping when all of a sudden that becomes tight, oop, like that. Notice what I did. I'm going to drop the rod again. We got a fish on. But I was, I was stripping down the line, all of a sudden got tight. And see how it's going out? I mean, it's because the fish is pulling on it. All you got to do is just raise that rod and pull down on the line, and the fish sets itself. And the, that's a problem with most people streamer fishing. When they when they're bring it back, they feel the bumps. They try setting on every one of the bumps. You don't set on the bumps. You only set once that line starts going the opposite way, and they picked up the fly. This fish hit it like three or four times before I connected up. And here we go. And we got a nice. Got a nice fish on right here. That's what most of the time, most of the fish you get with the streamer, this is probably one of the, the smaller sizes you get. A lot of times you get uh, trophy sized fish. But I tell you, in this time of, the, time of the day, especially with this kind of a fish, a brown trout, this is really the, the, uh, the time to bring your streamers out. Let's take a look at the Mr. Brown. Nice size brown. Yeah, look at that. And notice where he took the fly. It's right there. And see, he, he took that fly sideways, like that. That's where they take minnows. They take it sideways. And I cooked him on this side. And you hook him that way by doing the feel method. We'll talk about that in just a second. Here we go. Get him back and come back and get him next year. Woo! He just splattered me. One of the things is to be able to feel, and notice how I'm right, moving my rod so I can feel all the bumps. Now he's kind of bumping on the bottom. Now I'm going to go in and, again, you don't want to do much false casting. Just, again, notice my fingers right here. I've got the line just so I can feel it. Oops. Yeah, moving along, it had a bump right there. Again, I didn't set on it. Well, 
like to do if I'm fishing from a boat is to hit it, strip it out a ways, and then go back in and hit it again. I think a lot of times these fish will come right out and feel the, they'll feel the fly hit, and they'll actually go and investigate, follow it for a little way, change their mind. So you want to expose the fly to as many fish as possible. Again, I've got, I'm keeping my rod tip down. The nice thing about the sinking leader right here is it's going to, uh, I can actually mend down in the slower water to get that pull. I vary my strips, try to find out which is the right speed. You, what I always do is try to try the different velocities of, of strips, as we call this a strip. To find out what might entice a strike. Now I've got the what I'm going to do now is just kind of a, what I like for a fall technique where I'll cast down and just let the current swing it. No action, just like this. And I'm going to let it swing through the whole pool. Very slow, letting it sink, but almost like a dead grip. And I do this with woolly buggers a lot during the fall fishing. And, or in the spring when the fish aren't nearly as active. And again, letting the current take the belly of the line and let it swing it around, just like this. And when it swings around, Oop, bump, right there. You see, you feel it. Bump. And very slow, letting it sink. Ooh! Bump me, bump me. Come on, come on, come on. Uh, problems I see a lot when people first start to streamer fish, it's so different than dry fly fishing, is that they end up not realizing how important this fit, or the trigger finger, you might call it, is. To get that line right under the minute it hits, you, if you start having to reach around, you're missing one of the most critical parts of when that streamer hits. Or that woolly bugger, or any of those of these surface under surface situation like this in a lake or a stream or say you're lucky enough to go after a steelhead whether it's the west coast or around the uh, Lake Michigan area you need a line that's going to go down deep and if anybody out there has ever cast a full sinking line you'll know how tough it is to cast. A few years back uh, a good friend of mine by the name of Jim Teeny came up with a line system that has really kind of changed fishing uh, as we know it right now. What he did was attach a very heavy sinking line to a uh, floating line. And he usually uh, baited them anywhere from 10 to 25 feet. And when they first came out, it really changed everything because before we had what we called shooting headlines, where the lines were heavy and they were attached to some running line, which could be braided Dacron or even nylon. And when you cast them, they were really something because if you cast them, they would get tangled. We call this essentially a shooting head. And what that is, is it's a heavy line, very heavy. And what it'll do is it'll shoot out and it will pull the other line with it. It takes a certain casting technique that really makes this line very easy to cast. In fact, even people who have just are beginning casters, if they learn how to cast this line right, can cast it very easily. There's 25 uh, foot heads and there's 10 foot heads. They call those mini heads. Now the head is the sinking part of the line and this is what we call running line. Now Jim made to attach it to a floating line which made it easier to deal with. But over the years they've, they've made this and then perfected them with different types of cores so they shoot even uh, better than when Jim first 
uh, came out with the line. But let's talk about how you cast them. The first thing you want to know on a sinking line is you're not going to have a long leader. I usually use two sections a leader. Uh, this happens to be about 15 pounds. This is down to my tippet size uh, at about 8 pounds. Essentially, the leader is about 3.5 feet long, nothing more than uh, 4 feet. You want the leader and the line to be pretty close to each other. When picking the rod size, it's going to determine on what type of fish you're going after. If you're going to fish for steelhead, it's going to be a 7 and 8 weight. If you're going out in the ocean, it could be anywhere from a 9 to even a 12 weight. So we're going to get started here with the first steps on using this line. And of course, the cast is what it's all about. The first thing about casting this line, it ought to have a slash, no false casting. Because if you cast this in a normal false cast, you're going to be wearing uh, this line all around you. You're going to have one of these big flies right in the back of your neck. First of all, look how this is coming by me. Oh my God, it's got my name written all over it. So what we've got to do is not false cast it. We're going to shoot it. We're going to fire it straight out with only one back cast. And that's probably the hardest thing for a more experienced caster to get used to. Because everybody wants to false cast some and then shoot it. Carry the line. The big key is to not let that line get out of your rod, that sinking line. So let's take a look at it here. Here we go. First of all, because these are different colored, it's easy for you to see that. And I, what I'm going to do is pull in about a foot and a half of line into the guide. And one of the things you've got to learn with this is to learn to do a roll cast. And the first time you try it, don't put a fly on it. Just practice your roll cast like this, just going back and forth, making the roll cast so it hits the water just like this. See how I'm hitting the water with the roll cast? The line's in, nothing's happening. Now that's the first step. You learn and do that until you really got it down. And then what I'd like you to do is that after this, when this roll cast first hits the water, bring it straight back and let it slide through your fingers. What that does is the line will just, uh, the heavy part of that shooting head will pull the line out on the grass behind you. And this is a good place. We're in a park here. It's a great place to practice this, but at first, practice it without a heavy fly on it. Notice how it pulled the line out and I made a, a pretty good cast on the grass behind me. Now that's the first step. So we're going to do that first. Now let's go ahead and strip our line back in. And again, what are we going to do? We're, we're going to pull that in the rod again. We're going to start over. Let's practice it. Here we go again. It's going to hit the water, come back, let it go. And you can see the momentum that that line is going. It's pulling it out and you're ready to roll. Now, once you do that enough times, you feel pretty confident. Now we're ready to make the first shoot. And we're not going to put out too much line at the first cast. Okay, we're going to bring the line in for the next step of, of learning how to do this. Again, the foot and a half. We're going to roll cast it up. Now, let me just stop here for a second. Watch how my rod is going up here. I'm getting a little bit more leverage, then I'm pushing it forward, and the minute it hits the water, then you want to pull it back. Now, as you get better at it, you won't let it hit the water, but at first, it's best to let it hit the water. Okay, here we go. Hit the water, back, stop, forward, let go. That's all you want to do for that first step of that cast is to bring it back, let it just straighten out a little bit, then let it forward and just let go of the line. And now if it comes crashing back and hits your rod, that's because you didn't let it straighten out. You came forward too soon. So let's go ahead and try that one more time, and then we're going to start into the more advanced parts of this cast. If you can imagine, if you're sitting out in on, on a boat, or if you're on a big river, you may want to have a, a basket to hold this running line, as we call it here. We call that a stripping basket, especially if you're wading deep. But here, this is a good place to manage the line. As you can see, it's real easy to step on this line. Okay, so we're going to try that one more time. And we're going to, again, make sure it's in the rod. We're going to roll cast as it hit. Uh, the what we call shooting head teeny style lines. And I really like to give Jim Teeny the, the credit on developing this line. He did it for steelhead fishing. I'll tell you, if you're going to go fishing silvers in Alaska or Kings, you're going to have to have this line. It won't let you in the state without this line. If you're going to Baja, you're going to need this line. This line is the most universal under the water line that you should have. Now, what about a reel? Talk about reels. 
holy cow. He said, well, let's have like four extra spools. I'll never forget going to the tip of Argentina. The guy had one reel and seven extra spools. Now, in those extra spools, he had about $1,100 in spools. Guess what happened on the first day? He tripped and fell and bashed the reel up against a rock. And so what did he have? He had seven spools of line and no reel. Think about reels now. There's so many good large arbor drag reels, whether you shop at Cabela's for some of their signature reels, you can get a good saltwater reel with a good drag uh, for under $200, which you couldn't before. Now, the reason I'm saying this is to have more reels and less spool. Now, you might think I'm a little nuts on this. I don't have any reel that has more than two spools for that purpose. You want to make sure that you have the reel, because anything can happen, especially on a trip with the nearest fly shop 500 miles away, and that happens a lot. I always tell people that, why should I buy a really good, real, really good rod? I always say, the rod that you use the most ought to be the rod. I always like to keep the fish in the net, in the water. If you're wearing sun gloves, like I do all day long, as protection, I like to take off the one that I'm gonna handle the fish with. I always like to get my hand wet before I reach in, and a, a client of mine taught me a trick a long time ago about rainbows. I like to get my hand wet first before I touch the fish. Um, with rainbows, I find if I slip my pinky finger under their anal fins and tip them back, sometimes, the fish will actually stop rolling around on you just by putting all that pressure on his anal fins like that, flipping him back. Just bring that fly out. I always like to use my fingers to take the fly out instead of hemostats. Then I always put the fish back that in the net. Me. Always put the fish in the net and let him revive. Now that uh, now that we've uh, uh, had that cast. And